I'm happy to have Beat back on our uh, Razmafsar TV channel. Um, hi, Beat. How are you doing? Very well, thanks. One of our uh, subscribers asked uh, us about uh, Gaza Kant or Gaza Kant, as we say it in Persian. This is a specific type of armor, and we are going to discuss about uh, about it because our, we were asked, "What does this armor contain, or con what does it is con what does it consist of?" and so on. So let's open the discussion and I'm going to give the floor to Beat. So Beat, what is Qajar Kant or Qajar Kant as we say it in Persian? Well, um, we have descriptions of this armor. Specifically, um, the best detailed descriptions are in uh, this book, the, uh, the collected memoirs and writings of Usama ibn Munkif. This is the Penguin Classics edition, uh, and the translation is uh, a new one. The original translation was by Hitty. This is the Paul M. Cobb translation. Uh, Usama was a Syrian Arab warrior who worked for various Seljuk emirs and uh, spent time in Fatimid Egypt. And later on in his old age was uh, was a friend and and uh, at some stage a respected person by um, Salahdin. Um, he he lived through an early period of the conflict between the West and the East, the, the Crusaders and and um, the people living in Syria and Palestine. And he was a rather quirky person. He he. He described a lot of things that people would normally not describe. You find if you read, say, medieval text, medieval histories, that they tend to make assumptions that you already know things, so they don't describe them in detail. Oh, it's a such and such. And uh, the thing about uh, Osama is that he um, he reveled in details. He he loved things. He wrote a book on walking sticks, <laughs> which. Uh, it's called the Book of the Staff and bits of it survive uh, bits of his book the Book of Contemplation a lot more of that survives and there's another book called The Kernels of Refinement there's probably other things he wrote and maybe over the next 50 or 100 years people working in libraries in, in Egypt or Syria or, or, or Turkey or even Iran will find copies of these books and we'll know more. But he was a very, matter of fact author. He, he, he wasn't into this complex prose that was popular both among medieval Europeans and medieval Middle Easterns. So in his book, and I'll, I'll flick to the, um, the index, uh, uh, and I'm using the Arabic pronunciation here because this is an Arabic book, Kazakhan. Uh, um, uh, there's one, two, three, four, five references to it. The thing that's really important to know, I'll go to the last one, which uh, is really interesting because it actually describes the construction, not on purpose. He's just talking about something that comes along. So basically he says... Um, there is a, um, a, a, a general called uh, Eliahisiani, and he, he's organizing this thing. He comes up and he says, what we sent to you to get dressed in your armor, and you're not dressed in your armor. It's amazing. Your horse is ready and you're dressed, but you're not dressed in your armor. And, and uh, he says, where is your Kazakhstan armor? And at my order, my attendant brought it, took it out of its leather bag and pulling out my knife, I ripped a bit open at its chest and revealed the side of the two coats of mail. It had a Frankish coat of mail extending to its hem, which I'm guessing is probably mid thigh. It doesn't say, but it makes sense. With another above it extending as far as the middle, which I'm thinking is probably below the sternum. So what effectively had was two coats of mail on. One was kind of like a um, short jacket, 
and the other one was probably hip or, or mid thigh. And but this is really important. He says both had all the linings, felt pads, rough silk, and rabbit fur. Al Yahisiani then turned to one of his attendants and said something to him in Turkish. I don't understand what he was saying. The servant presently brought before Al Yahisiani a horse that the Atabeg had given him. This would be probably Nuruddin or Zengi, maybe Zengi. Once upon a time, a dark chestnut charger looking like a block of granite quarried from the summit of some mountain. He liked this horse. This horse, said the attendant, befits that Kazagant. <laughs> deliver it to the attendant of this man. And so he delivered it to the attendant of yours truly. Now, there's several things that are really important here that don't necessarily get into descriptions of armor. One is he wasn't wearing it all the time because it was heavy. It probably was no more than 10 or 15 kilos. But when you're on campaign, you want to be as fit as possible. You don't want to be dragging around the stuff. He had it in a leather bag. Later on in another part, he says that it was carried on mules that were bought behind him. So you didn't put your armor on and then, and, and then go on campaign. You waited until there was a battle imminent and put your armor on, which is the reason why sometimes armies were attacked on the march and totally destroyed because hardly anyone was wearing their armor because they didn't expect an attack. Armor was hot. You saw layers of felt, layers of mail. Rabbit fur um, may have been a lining, uh, so that the inner lining may have been rabbit fur, then felt, then mail, then felt, then mail, then an outer layer of, of some beautiful material. And the, the thing about it is, if you are wearing a Kazagan, it looks like an ordinary coat. Yeah. Um, and it's probably important to remember that a lot of Persian and Akoyanlu male armors that survive are front opening like a coat, not like a, a European one that you put over your head. Absolutely front opening. Yeah. And it's possible that many of these were actually inside cloth linings ones. Yeah. Because the cloth linings don't necessarily survive. Yes. And when you think about it, a lot of those armors, like the necks particularly, would sit better if they were inside a line jacket. They droop a little bit in, in when it's just the mail by itself. It's even possible that some of the plate mail armors were originally completely encased in fabric. Now, the thing about this is there is no way of telling a, a, a Kazagan from a, a uh, what they call a uh, uh, kakal. Kakal is a brigandine. This is little plates riveted inside um, a cloth outer covering. Like the Chinese uh, wear, correct? The Chinese develop quite efficient versions of these, but I've got Saracen archery here by Taibuka in the 1360s. And in the section on arrows, he refers to a chisel headed arrow. And he said, like the Maidani, it is cylindrical, but its point is tapered to a blade on two opposite sides so as to present the appearance of a scalpel. The edge of the blade as wide as the diameter of the body. I have tested this head and found it will pierce the lamini of a brigandine, Kakao, as well as possible to do so. Actually, I've got one of those arrows somewhere around here. Uh, it's not in this room, but... Uh, um, and there, if you imagine, imagine you'd taken a, a cylinder and you'd ground from both sides until you had a straight edge at the top, but you hadn't spread it out or anything. And this, with a tempered blade, just splits the rings of mail, but it will also cut through little plates. So at the time of um, Taibuka, in the Middle East, now Taibuka wrote in Syria, and, you know, the, the interchange between Syria and Iraq was pretty common. Uh, he knew about this. If you read its Maya Mameluk costume, uh, talks about Kazagan as well. I haven't got a copy with me, but it's, um, it's quite detailed. Um, 
the 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 concept of an armor that looked like a piece of clothing that was flexible, that was um, tailored, I suppose, um, was very common in the Middle East. Yeah. And uh, if you look at Persian paintings from the Safavid dynasty, right? I'm thinking particularly of of in the uh, the 1540s and thereabouts. You see people in coats with little rivets on the surface of the coats, but they're not very close together. They're kind of they're fairly random, and sometimes there's a steel plate, yes, sticking right in the middle. This is almost certainly a kazagan as opposed to a charcoal, because on a a uh, kako, you have rows of rivets showing where the plates are. Whereas in a kazagan, the rivets would be just to hold the outside to the male. There's, a, there's a male. Sorry. Excuse me. It's a very interesting point Bid is uh, making because, you know, very often we are always asked, where is the male armor shown in miniatures? If you have only one thing, uh, you know, which have to, to me is very surprising. I'm sure you know that. And we have a, um, a copy of it in the uh, Iranian museums. This is Tarikh Jahangoshay Naderi, the world conquest of Nader, which one of his uh, guys who accompanied him wrote it. And then another painter, painted the battlefields. And in Persian, in Persian, it's called the paintings, not the miniatures of Tariq Jahan Gushay Naderi. They are very praised for being very specific. For example, you see that the Shamshirs, okay, during Nader Shah, they're all highly cared, of, of course, Nader Shah, but yeah, they Nader are Shah. all wearing male armor, mostly, not all. Most of them, the male armor is shown and with char aine on top of it. And they're fighting with lances and with lances, swords and whatever. But male is really shown. Some of them, some of them, not many of them, possibly, as you say, are wearing Kazakhan, but most of them, male is shown. But when you go yeah. one period back, like in the Safavid period, it, it is not shown. So in Tarikh Jahan Gushay Naderi, which is praised for, the, for its realistic painting, it doesn't mean Safavid period are not realistic. Don't take me wrong. But they are yeah. shown. Male armor is really shown, combined with people who are wearing coat and possibly their Kazakhand. Because it can't be yeah. that the Persian army, some of them are wearing male, and next are fighting with the coat, sorry, with Basuban. It can't be, yeah. right? Yeah, excuse me. This Go is ahead. true, and, and it's one of the things that, that if you um, uh, look at the um, British reports of fighting in northern India, uh, after the wide deployment of fire, firearms, armour stopping firearms doesn't work, right? Firearms shoot holes through armour. But armour still is very good against swords. So what you do is you step back and go back to things like mail because they're light, they're flexible, they'll stop swords. They won't stop guns, but nothing will stop guns. But if you actually get into close fighting with people, you're better defended. And I have a feeling that um, this is the reason that mail survived so long in Iran and northern India and places like that, because there was a clear idea. You can go this far and then you stop. Uh, the European plate armour was really great against stopping almost everything, um, including heat exchange and breathing. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the thing was that it was designed to be a complete protection. And once guns were in, in, introduced, then it became totally obsolete. And the Europeans oscillated between no armour and some armour. And they had but like the Black Riders with with cuirasses and, and, and thigh protection and arm protection. But in the East, the introduction of guns meant, right, well, there's no point in doing this, but we're all possibly going to end up fighting hand-to-hand -hand at some stage, so we want some kind of protection. Bazaban, um, maybe Kazagan, maybe just male shirts. I've got a book here. I don't know if it's in this bookshelf. Um, I've got too many books. Uh, no, probably not. It's probably in another bookshelf. It, it was it was published in the Soviet Union, 
on oh. Azerbaijani painting. And uh, <coughs> me. and it's very rare. It's paintings from the 16th century or thereabout. Very rare in showing plate and mail armour. And mail armour with different coloured links on the, on the um, borders. Uh, unfortunately, I got a lot of book bookcases and I can't get to them quickly. Uh, but um, the book is entitled in English Azerbaijani Miniatures. It was in English, Russian and Azerbaijani in, in Cyrillic characters, I think. It may have been in Latin characters. I'm not sure now. It's, it's been a few years since I've looked at it. So there were paintings showing different types of armour in use. And it's important if you're trying to work out what kind of armour was being used, not to get too carried away saying, oh, this guy is... Well, I've seen this in books and, and you can find books that do this. This person is clearly, he's got a short sleeve cap then on, he's clearly wearing mail underneath it. Or maybe it's a Kazagan. Um, as I said, the, the Karkal, the Brigantine, is very easy to, to um, identify because there's a lot more rivets. Yes. I was going to say earlier, there's a, there's a male shirt belonging to one of the princes of Transylvania which I think is in a Polish collection now. And uh, it's got gilded links and everything, but there's a, a quite a large number of riveted decorative metal pieces over the body of the armor. And it's not beyond belief that this was originally covered with cloth and all you saw were these little star shaped pieces and whatever, because they were holding the mail in, in the relation to the, to the covering and the lining. And you might say, well, why would you bother? And the answer is, of course, mail would wear from the inside. Because if your mail is moving freely against your covering and your lining, it's going to start to cause trouble. Now, you can stitch it down, which I think was probably more commonly done. But if you're rich and you want to show off, you have rivets and beautiful little conchos or whatever. Uh, and uh, it looks really nice. You might even see Kazagan seems to be quite old. I mean, uh, Usama was writing in the 12th century. Um, so I would think that what we're really looking at is male shirts we know from Sasanian times, just bare male shirts. Yes. The, the concept of covering them and putting them inside fabric has lots of advantages. It stops them being directly exposed to the sun. And one of the problems with metal armor is it heats up and cools down really fast. So if it's cold, you get colder. If it's hot, you get hotter. Um, so if you've got it in between layers, and, and, and uh, we're talking about multiple layers here, then that makes a more comfortable armour to wear. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't change its, its effectiveness, except that padding may actually be an advantage. We, we often hear the descriptions of people wearing um, padded uh, Horbajons or Akatons or whatever, and mail over the top of that, which is nice. But in reality, if, it, if the padding was thick and the mail was reasonably strong, then your armour becomes very stifling in any weather. Even in Northern Europe, it would be really uncomfortable to wear for you know several hours, unless it was snowing or something. I'm going to move on to um, Oriental Costumes by um, H. Russell Robinson. Uh, he has some quite strange transliterations, but you've got to remember when this was written uh, and not really hold it against him. The, the original was 1967. So there was no... Okay. Yeah, there was no, there was no kind of um, uh, fixed thing in popular literature for how to spell things or how to refer to things. And uh, I, I think it's important to remember that. We, 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 some people kind of get a bit carried away condemning people from like 67 is a long time ago. I mean, I was very young then. <laughs> um, I was still at school. <laughs> so you, you've got to, you know, it's, 
it's a long time ago. Now, there's two references to Kazagand. I actually sent you an email with the details. And um, uh, there's also a photograph. Now, as far as I know, there are two surviving Kazagan. One is in Topkapi Sarai, and the other one is in the British Museum. I've tried to track down the British Museum one today. I have had no success at all, but I'm sure that we will eventually track it down, even if I've got to write to the museum and find out. Uh, on page 64, as I say, remember, this is really quite early in the study of Eastern Armour in the West. Um, a rich body defence worn under ordinary clothes, of which an example survives in Topkapi Sarayi Muzizi, is the Kazagan, to use its Arabic appellation. This is a male shirt covered inside and out with fabric, and because it could be both rich in appearance and comfortable to wear, it must have been a popular form of light arming. Many of the male shirts and coats surviving today may have originally been mounted in this manner, but all traces of fabric have rotted away. The Kapasurai uh, specimen has long sleeves with mitten-like extensions for the backs of the hands and small ball buttons and loops to close the front and the wrists of the sleeves. There are also five buttons on each breast across the top uh, of the two pocket-like patches for the attachment of containers for um, cartridge bottles, such as one associates with Georgian and later Cossack dress. Uh, they're talking about those little um, multiple cartridge, cartridge pockets that uh, uh, were very popular in, in um, that kind of clothing. Uh, this example is said to be of the 16th century, and there's a, there's a reference to the plate. Another covered with yellow silk and without the attachment for cartouche pouches is in the British Museum and is probably of the late 17th century. So this was used outside the medieval period. It was, because it's quite practical. Now, um, we're not, well, I can't, but even if I could, for copyright reasons, you wouldn't want to get too carried away with this. The bottom uh, photograph there yeah. is the um, one in uh, top copy. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. You would never think, you would never think that that was a fully armoured coat. It just looks like a really flash coat. It's Ottoman, and, right? Uh, yeah, that's it... the Ottoman one. Yes. Perfect. 16th century in top oh, right. really? uh, You can actually see coloured version. If you if you look up uh, Kazagand on Google or or the um, European version of that word is Jazaran. Oh, okay. Uh, and and it has exactly the same meaning. And um, you will come up with a picture of that eventually. Uh, it's on Pinterest. It's on all kinds of things. I didn't send you one uh, for the purposes of this interview because I have no idea what the copyright status is. No, no. The Kapu Sarai is, is quite generous. Yes. Um, as Bill Kent and, and other Turkish um, museums I, and universities, they're very... As you know, as you know uh, uh, we have very good contacts with uh, Turkish universities and different publications and also museums. Yeah, they're, they're very, Turkish, honestly, they're very yeah. nice people to do. I, yes, I really absolutely. like them. There's another mention on page 77. Oh, yeah, that's just referring back to Osama. It says, Osama also describes the type of male much used by the Saracens, in quotes. This is the Kazagand, a male shirt sewn between two layers of fabric, the other one a rich material. This defence was also used by the Turks, and he refers back to that previous chapter. So here we have... Um, the surviving ones are from the 16th, 17th century. The earliest um, easily found reference is the 12th century. Uh, and in all probability, these, um, this idea is quite old because it's just such a practical thing. A male shirt conforms to your body quite well if it's tailored to fit in at the waist and that. It would be hard to tell you were wearing it. And you can go back to Herodotus describing the Battle of Plataea when the Greeks attempted to kill the Persian commander Masistos. And they kept stabbing at him and it wasn't working. And eventually they tore his coat and they realized he had a coat of scale armor underneath it. 